aus Europa sind auch keine Verhandlungsinitiativen gekommen, was ich sehr No negotiation initiatives have come from Europe either, which I deeply regret. Apart from the Pope perhaps, but he was also strongly rebuffed. So in that respect, we will see how we get out of this war. I can only say there is no military solution. The personnel situation in Ukraine is dramatically bad, not least due to the departure of almost 700,000 able-bodied Ukrainian men. Alone, 200,000 live in Germany, receive citizens' income here, claim conscientious objection, and understandably do not want to return to Ukraine to fight for their country. At the same time, we are discussing sending our own sons and soldiers there to liberate Ukraine. This is a bizarre, crazy situation. Hello everyone. Here I am once again speaking in German, because today I am discussing with Dr. Eric Wad, a former German Brigadier General with extensive experience in security policy. Mr. Wad was an advisor for security and defense policy in the Bundestag from 2000 to 2006, as well as a group leader in the Federal Chancellery, Secretary of the Federal Security Council, and military advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel from 2006 to 2013. Recently, Dr. Wad authored a new book titled Deterrent or Frightening, Europe Without Security. And it is a book with a clear message. Europe must strengthen itself militarily and emancipate itself economically. Germany should be a driving force in this. Deutschland sollte dabei eine treibende Kraft sein. Während dem ich mit einigen von Herrn While I do not fully or even at all agree with some of Mr. Wad's recommendations, I find his analysis of current events very worth reading. This is because it clearly comes from a realist perspective, coupled with strong military considerations regarding European security. That is what we want to talk about today. Dr. Wad, thank you for taking the time. Dr. Wad, vielen Dank, dass Sie sich die Zeit nehmen. Yes, thank you as well, Mr. Lataz. Mr. Wad, you wrote your doctoral thesis on Karl von Clausewitz, if I saw that correctly. What would Mr. von Clausewitz say about today's security situation in Europe? Naja. Well, Karl von Clausewitz has been dead for almost 200 years now, but he did write a very far-reaching book on war. About 40 years ago, as a young officer, I wrote a dissertation on the relevance of Clausewitz alongside my service. I did this under an Israeli military historian, Yehuda Wallach, who lived in a country that saw war as a means of politics to this day. That was very different in Germany 40 years ago. It is quite interesting to me that today in high politics we are dealing with the issue of war again. Back then my dissertation on Clausewitz was somewhat criticized by experts because it focused on warfare. At that time the aim was to prevent war, for example, within the framework of NATO's deterrence strategy. And then it was somewhat excused because my doctoral advisor lived in a country where war still had to be a means of politics. This is an interesting phenomenon for me, that today many politicians are practically driving us into a military conflict and motivating us to do so. What would Clausewitz say? I believe, with regard to the Ukraine war, that it is certainly very important to clearly define one's political goals before going to war. One must have a strategic concept to achieve these goals, and these political goals must be realistic. Above all, one must already consider the peace after the war in the deliberations. None of this is the case with our military support for Ukraine. Clausewitz would certainly criticize this, and as his student, I naturally criticize it as well. This brings us to the core of your book. I believe it bothers you a lot that at the moment, people in Germany and also in Europe do not recognize the political direction we are heading in and that this affects the security situation of the continent. Could you perhaps briefly present the main theses 
or the main criticism of the book. The main criticism of the book is that one must understand the political nature of the Ukraine war. It is a legitimate defensive war of an attacked country, and it is entirely legitimate for us to help this country. But one must also see that it is a proxy war between the USA and Russia. Behind Russia stands China as well. This significance of the war must be understood. Many analysts deny this and say it is not true. When one speaks of a proxy war, one is often labeled as a Putin sympathizer or accused of serving the Russian narrative. These are thought prohibitions that one has imposed on oneself. But it is, of course, the case that the background of this war is the geopolitical rivalry between the USA and Russia. The point is that we have a similar scenario to the Cuban Missile Crisis. In 1962, Kennedy could not allow the Soviet Union to establish a military presence in Cuba because that is a vital sphere of interest for the USA, to this day, the Caribbean and Panama. There have also been military interventions in recent years, and this is a sanctuary that dates back to the Monroe Doctrine, if you will. One must consider this strategic dimension of a conflict. The Cuban Missile Crisis is an example for me. Kennedy had to be ready to go as far as a nuclear war at that time. He could not allow it. And he then resolved this crisis and this war very diplomatically, wisely, and prudently. I miss that to this day, because it is a similar scenario. The Russians cannot allow from their geostrategic position that the West essentially takes control of the Crimea region and the Black Sea region, and above all, deprives them of the possibility to guarantee control over the Black Sea coast by land, also with regard to the Black Sea fleet, the only ice-free ports that Russia has. One simply has to understand this from the Russian perspective. By the way, it is similar with China. So China will remain adamant regarding the South China Sea and also Taiwan. So, if you want to provoke a third world war, you just have to declare Taiwan independent, and then it will certainly start. Turkey is doing something similar. Many people insisted very strongly on the right to self-determination for the Kurds from an international law perspective decades ago. Today, all of that is forgotten. But the Kurds are also waging a war in northern Iraq and in Syria, that is, outside of Turkey. Turkey will never allow the Kurds to establish their own state, regardless of the right to self-determination and international law. They cannot do this out of strategic interest. They also form a buffer zone to prevent exactly this development. And they are doing this with military means. There are probably more examples. Also, das ist einfach so. Es gibt wahrscheinlich noch mehr Beispiele. I find that very interesting, because this analysis of yours, which I share, I can fully endorse. What you have said here, that one can simultaneously admit that a war is taking place, that should not be happening in this way, and that Ukraine has a right to self-defense, but that this war was also provoked and that it could have been de-escalated at various points beforehand. One can perceive these two things at the same time. But it seems to me that in today's political discourse, this is not allowed, at least if you listen to the mainstream. What do you associate this with? And you have seen in Germany, at other times even during the Cold War, realism was a very important pillar in shaping its foreign policy. And that seems to be less the case today. Or how do you see it? Yes, I also miss this realism, especially in relation to German foreign and security policy, which must be value-oriented or feminist. You know the terms from the debate, and that is precisely the political romanticism that has always led Germany astray. Now regarding this conflict, Berlin essentially has no decisive role. 
The decisions are made in Washington, in Moscow, perhaps in Beijing, but not in Brussels and not in Berlin. One simply has to see that. Aber nicht in Brüssel und nicht in Berlin. Das muss man einfach sehen. Insofern ist das, was die deutsche Außenpolitik macht. In this respect, what German foreign policy is doing is actually just a rhetorical accompaniment to what is being done. They are not the shapers of the conflict, and they are the biggest supporters of Ukraine. It is also appropriate that we face this support. But the excessiveness that sometimes becomes visible when people say we must destroy, defeat and beat the Russians, recapture Donbass or Crimea, and fight to the last. And then also in Germany, this belief in miracle weapons. As a historian, I really have to smile sometimes if it weren't so sad, because we've seen all this before. Muss ich manchmal lächeln, wenn es nicht so traurig wäre, weil wir das ja alles schon mal hatten. Und auch dieser unbedingte Glaube an den Sieg, in dem Fall der. And this unconditional belief in victory, in this case for Ukraine, which I also naturally wish for, is so far removed from military reality that it is not foreseeable at all. Nevertheless, there are commentators who claim exactly that almost every other day. They say Ukraine just needs enough weapons, then it will decisively defeat the Russians. This is also spread in the mainstream media. But that is very, very far from the overall military situation and also from reality. This way of thinking in Germany, this well-intentioned idealism has often led us to ruin. Uns schon sehr oft ins Verderben geführt hat. Und wir müssen da wirklich aufpassen, auch mit unserer Rhetorik. Und and we really need to be careful, also with our rhetoric. So I'm very much in favor of choosing a realistic approach, also in our foreign and security policy, and not spreading these utopias further. I repeatedly advocate the view and analysis that neutrality is a very important concept of realism. Neutrality for Ukraine would have been, I believe, simply the ultimate solution. Do you agree with me on this or not? Yes, I believe it was the concept in the past that was correct and purposeful because it also took into account Russia's security interests. This path was abandoned in 2014, as you know. This also led to the annexation of Crimea. Ultimately, this was a reaction to the fact that, from the Russian perspective, it was unacceptable for Ukraine to begin striving for NATO membership. I was present at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008 when this NATO membership was rejected by Germany and France. The mistake, in my view, was that this perspective was left open. For the Russians, as the then American ambassador in Moscow Burns said, it was a dark red line, and it remains so to this day. Linie einfach, und die ist es bis zum heutigen Tage. Es kann aber sein, dass man jetzt. It may be that now, as time has passed and there have been many developments in the meantime, the situation needs to be assessed differently. Former Chancellor Angela Merkel tried to save what could be saved in these Minsk agreements, and that ultimately failed. Today, we have a new situation. With regard to Donald Trump and his mentality, I can certainly imagine that if he becomes president, he would simply call his friend Vladimir and say, let's end this, we'll just divide it up then I wouldn't rule out the possibility that, under certain conditions, Western Ukraine could eventually join NATO. So that's a bit of future speculation. We might also be heading towards a Korea solution, and the whole thing will be kept open. It worked very well in Korea with this demarcation line. We just have to wait and see. I'm not a clairvoyant. I only see that there is no military solution to this war. I've been saying that for months, and I feel sorry for the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who are dying and don't have the opportunity, like almost 700,000 able-bodied Ukrainians, to flee abroad. That's basically what concerns me also as a military man and soldier. I have nothing against war in principle. I can't as an ex-general. But I do have something against senseless wars, and I have something against it when... If politics fundamentally does not help to get out of wars, but rather incites and exacerbates them, 
It is an extremely dangerous process, especially against the backdrop of a looming nuclear war, a world war, or a European war. That has not been eliminated. This is what I don't understand. How is it that we in Europe, and I include Switzerland in this, because the reporting in Switzerland goes in very similar directions, are largely ready to go into a European nuclear war? It is relatively clear that if a nuclear war breaks out, it will be fought on European soil at the beginning. That was clear even before the war, and it is still clear today. Before Washington and Moscow start shooting at each other, it will happen within Europe. How do you explain that the federal government does not seem to be afraid of this at the moment, or even says that one should not be afraid of such a thing? We must continue now. Yes, it surprises me too that the Europeans themselves are pushing for a Europeanization of the conflict. Detached from the USA and even saying we must prepare now in case Trump comes and no longer has much interest in this war, so that we can continue it. That really surprises me a lot. It is somewhat self-delusion and simply due to the fact that especially in Germany, people have not experienced or lived through a war for 80 years. It is far away. So this war rhetoric, this careless handling of war, is very, very concerning, and simply due to the fact that most people believe it is a TV event, or at best a football game. It is far removed from oneself. It has something to do with the Air Force, but not with the other things that are typical of wars, like massacres, rapes, murder and manslaughter, blood. War means that the enemy soldier comes into my house, sets it on fire, and kills everyone inside. That is war. And that needs to be made clear. On the one hand, we now have a lot of war movies in the media again, where this is also addressed. But there is no serious examination of what threatens if we venture into this field. It remains the high art of statecraft, especially in the nuclear age, to prevent war because, in the end, it is not militarily winnable. That is the point. And that makes the difference from the First World War. In 1914, we had enormous enthusiasm for war, not only in Berlin, but also in Paris, London and Moscow. In Berlin, even critical and thoughtful people like Max Lieberman, Gerhard Hauptmann and Thomas Mann, who were not warmongers, suddenly adopted a belligerent stance. They wanted this war. And none of them would have wished for this war back four years later, considering what it has become. What I also write in the book is that war is unpredictable. Clausewitz pointed out that often something entirely different comes out than what was intended, but with the side effect of millions of deaths. The difference to 1914 is that historical comparisons are always a bit flawed. People also use the appeasement policy towards Hitler to justify that one must deal with Putin, who is equated with Hitler, in the same way. These are all very flawed historical analogies. But there are parallels. In 1914, for example. And massive differences, above all. In 1914, Germany had the strongest army on the continent. In 1914, Germany had politicians who knew the military, who had served, and did not come from pacifism and the peace movement, as is the case today. And in 1914, there were no nuclear weapons. That means, if we go to war, in any form, a European war, we have this scenario where we also cannot win this war militarily. Even there, we will eventually have to negotiate if we do not want to kill each other. So all these things must simply be considered before one so carelessly spreads war rhetoric throughout the country. With voices like, we need to take the Russian ministries in Moscow under fire, 
We need to carry the war deep into the hinterland of Russia. Incidentally, this is also viewed very critically by the Americans, including this discussion about long-range weapons. It was the Americans who said that it remains limited to the Kharkiv region and to military targets in Russia that are directly combating the Kharkiv region due to the lack of spatial depth. This is very, very strongly conditioned and played no role in the German debate. Today, German politicians want much, much more than that. In the American debate, the Ukraine war is discussed much more critically in the political confrontation between Republicans and Democrats than in Germany. Here we really have a very, very consensus-oriented debate, and anyone who deviates from this feels it strongly. It is quite astonishing, this fundamentalism and the disregard for realpolitik, no matter the cost, to go all in and even deploy ground troops, is so far removed from military feasibility that one can only marvel at these caprices. But you have served in more than one cabinet of Chancellor Merkel, and you were there, as can be seen on your homepage, with the pictures of Mrs. Merkel. How do the decision-making processes work in the Chancellery? How is it that at some point there isn't a big, stop, we're not doing this, coming from the Chancellery? Although, to be fair, I have to say, Mr. Schultz is the one who often says we are no longer delivering weapons or no larger weapons with even greater range. Then the press writes about it for two or three weeks, about how he hesitates or dithers. The word dither keeps coming up. And then there is the green light for even more weapons in this conflict. Is that directly correlated? Or do you have the feeling that the decision advisors in the Chancellery share this media opinion one-to-one? -one? No, I don't see it that way. I think the Chancellor's policies and the role of the Chancellery overall were very reasonable, balanced and prudent. Well, they gave in last year to the massive demands to deliver Leopard 2 tanks, which were supposed to be game changers in turning the tide of the war. I spoke out against it at the time, not because I have anything against Leopard tanks in principle. I think it's a great weapon system. I also have nothing against the delivery of weapons. Only the goal of bringing about a turning point in the war with them was absolutely unrealistic at the time. But no one wanted to know that. The media put a lot of pressure on the Chancellery until it eventually delivered 18 Leopard tanks, which no one talks about today but are missing from the Bundeswehr. That's the factual situation. It will take another year and a half before they have these 18 tanks back. And the Bundeswehr is not exactly in a state where one can say it doesn't matter. At times, we had fewer battle tanks than Switzerland in recent years. We now have well below 300 operational battle tanks. This is just a detail, but it must also be seen. The Chancellery has given in to this media and political pressure. It is not easy to act as Chancellor in a coalition with three parties. He has to keep the Greens, the Liberals, and his own party, which is also not in a strong political state, together. And that is not easy. Given these conditions, which I know well from my years in the Federal Chancellery, he has already tried to make the best of it. That must be acknowledged. Okay, and now one last question about your experiences, and then we'll move on to the recommendations you have. But something I still don't understand is, how is it that the Europeans, and especially the Germans, seem to have buried the investigation of Nord Stream 2? That there is no interest in finding that out. Can you explain that? Yeah, this is... Well, that's a good question. I mean, in the end, there are several theories about how this came about. These are circulating, and the federal prosecutor's office has been investigating the case for months. Nothing is leaking to the media, 
We have decades of experience with excellent investigative journalists who have uncovered all sorts of things. Think of the Panama Papers or other scandals that they have triggered and published through meticulous research work. In this case, there is silence in the forest. So I believe this is a field of speculation. I'm also surprised that there is not the same relentless clarification as in many other areas. But here, the national interest is probably to talk as little as possible about it. I can understand that well, but I don't want to say more about it. All right, all right, we'll leave it at that. Now, regarding your recommendations, especially in the conclusion of your book, you give clear action recommendations on what Europe should do. Could you list your most important points and explain how they relate to the current world events? Well, Europe is far from being an independent security policy actor in this new, multipolar world. We not only have the USA, which has long lost its role in world order, they are in confrontation with China and Russia. Additionally, there is the formation and expansion of the BRIC states. So it is heading towards a multipolar world that cannot be denied. One has to see whether Europe wants to continue being the free rider of the USA. Militarily, we are. That is exactly the problem. We have never been as militarily dependent on the USA as we are today. And politically, it has never been so necessary to essentially pursue an independent European policy, together with the Americans in the Western alliance. At the moment, I don't want to leave this alliance, which has proven itself for our security for 75 years. However, one must also critically consider its further development. It must not be that NATO essentially remains the anvil for worldwide American military operations. NATO is a defensive alliance, a defense alliance against threats. The new threat is certainly Russia, primarily China, but not only. We have to deal with that and prepare for it. Und damit muss man umgehen und äh, darauf muss man sich auch vorbereiten. Und ich bin für Dialog und Interessenausgabe. And I am in favor of dialogue and balancing interests with Russia and also with China. But as a military person, I can only say that this is only possible in combination with military strength, which we currently do not have. There is certainly a need for action to bring our armed forces up to date so that we can protect Europe, both with military and non-military means. I explicitly pointed out in my book the huge open southern flank of Europe and the ongoing illegal migration that we do not have under control. That's just the way it is. And that is also a massive security problem. So it's not just a military issue, the security of Europe. We really need to urgently do something about it. And Europe must see itself as an equal partner to the USA, not just as a subordinate. That's not enough. Also, regarding our foreign policy, it's not sufficient for me if our foreign minister, if Blinken says something and she says the same thing in German, six hours later. That's not enough. Even with regard to the Ukraine war, there are different interests of the Europeans compared to the Americans. These are not identical. The theater of war alone is over 5,000 miles away from the USA. He is on European soil. We will also have Russia as a neighbor after this war, and we will have to deal with it. As Europeans, we cannot have an interest in experiencing a new edition of the Cold War, with a front line that is four or five times as long as it was back then. These are different interests, and we need to discuss them with our most important ally. It has always been the case that we have tried to combine military strength with dialogue and balancing interests, even in the history of NATO. This is the so-called Harmel Doctrine since the 1960s. That has always been our guiding principle. And when it came to military intervention in the strategic spheres of interest of the other, the competitor, we were always cautious. 
Think of the Hungarian uprising in 1956. At that time, Eisenhower was president of the United States, and there were calls for arms deliveries and support for the Hungarians. The West helped as much as possible, but there were no arms deliveries. Eisenhower said at the time that he would not start a third world war over Hungary. A similar example is the Czech crisis in 1968. 450,000 soldiers of the Warsaw Pact occupied and overran Czechoslovakia at that time. A similar scenario as in Ukraine. NATO was alarmed, we mobilized, but we tried to resolve the whole situation politically because realistically one cannot want any other solution. All these things that NATO has done right in the past, we must also do right in the future. We cannot simply accept an attack like the one on February 24th, 2022. That is absolutely correct. Something must happen, and military support is also appropriate. But it must be measured and prudent. It must not be escalatory and must not directly lead to a third world war. That simply cannot happen. Well, the tragedy here is that it has become relatively clear by now that Russia's strategy in 2022 was to force negotiations through an invasion. This was successful. However, the invasion force of 190,000 soldiers was too small to control the entire area they marched through. The aim was to force Kiev to negotiate. That worked but the result never materialized. After that, the war mutated into something else, into this trench warfare that we have been seeing for two years now. There are many commentators who blame Boris Johnson and also the USA for this. They said, don't make peace with the Russians, we will give you weapons and then you can fight it out. How do you assess this situation? Well, at the beginning of the war, there was certainly a chance to find a solution with the Istanbul talks. Turkey played a very strong mediating role, which was and is motivated by real politic. Turkey is an important NATO country. It has the second largest army in NATO in Europe and is of great geostrategic importance, much more significant than Germany, also for future conflicts. It is essentially the bridgehead of the West up to Central Asia. Turkey had a very balanced policy towards Russia. She does not participate in the sanctions against Russia. However, she also supplies weapons to Ukraine, but she also receives weapons from Russia. She also gets gas and oil from Russia. During the war, they concluded a bilateral economic agreement with the Russians. They pursue a very balanced policy and initiated this grain agreement in conjunction with the United Nations. There were permanent talks with Erdogan, Putin, and Guterres during this time, and also constant political exchange. When I hear in the German debate that one must not and cannot negotiate with Putin, I see it differently. This has already been refuted countless times by our NATO partner Turkey. However, I believe that Turkey might now be out of a potential mediator role with regard to peace talks. I think that China, if we consider the Chinese-Brazilian peace proposal for negotiations from the end of May, picks up many points from the Istanbul talks. These in turn are also very much based on the Minsk agreements. It is quite possible that China will also succeed because the Russians have simply become junior partners of the Chinese. We have practically driven the Russians into this role, where one must also ask whether this was so wise from a Western perspective. But it is just the way it is. The Chinese have a very strong influence on Moscow and are certainly an equal partner, especially with regard to the USA. It is quite conceivable that China will manage this, perhaps in the next few weeks and months. I don't know, and we have to wait and see. But the risk is, the Chinese have also ended the decades-long conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That should not be underestimated. It wasn't the Americans, but China as a mediator.
And if China succeeds in ending the Ukraine war, then they are no longer just a Eurasian power, but a power that from that day on has a say in European security. Personally, I do not wish for this, but the West is so blocked by the elections in the USA that one probably cannot expect anything before the end of the elections. No negotiation initiatives have come from Europe either, which I deeply regret, apart from the Pope perhaps, but he was also very, very strongly rebuffed. So in this respect, we will see how we come out of this war. I can only say that there is no military solution. The personnel situation in Ukraine is dramatically bad, not least due to the departure of almost 700,000 able-bodied Ukrainian men. 200,000 of them live in Germany alone. Citizens here receive citizens' income, refuse military service, do not want to return to Ukraine for understandable human reasons and fight for their country there. At the same time, we are discussing sending our own sons and soldiers there to liberate Ukraine. This is a bizarre, crazy situation, and it is actually very unreasonable. The balance of power in the Ukraine war does not allow for a military solution. I have been saying this for months. And it has been clear for months, maybe even a year and a half, that it will be difficult. The American Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, had clearly stated before his retirement that a military solution is extremely difficult. The RAND Corporation has conducted corresponding studies. The Americans have always been very cautious, and in reality, no one believes in a military solution anymore. But politically, nothing or very little is happening, at least in Europe. I also criticize this to some extent with regard to Germany, because we have the peace mandate in the preamble of our basic law. What we are doing is not constitutional, and we are not doing everything we can to end this war. But the tragic thing about the situation is that there are people who actively demand that the war should continue, with the view that one can bleed the Russians dry. So, the Afghanization of Ukraine, because a prolonged guerrilla war of attrition, will eventually wear down the Russians. This mindset does exist, and also the idea that more Ukrainians need to be sent to fight there. This actually comes from the EU, saying we need to send people back, they need to go to the front. To me, that is profoundly inhumane, or at least sounds that way. The tragedy is that there are people who want to continue this war because they have an interest in letting Ukraine continue to bleed, especially in the interest of the USA. It is definitely not a European interest. Well, the European interest is somewhat that if the Russians are successful there, they might target other countries. Key words, Georgia, Moldova. The Baltic states are already fearful due to their historical experiences. One must consider the possibility that if the Russians are successful, they might develop a taste for more and say, it worked well, let's continue. This must be viewed critically. But it is not automatic, and one must be very careful with this domino theory. We always have the Vietnam War as a prominent example. The Americans believe that if they let Vietnam go and it became communist, then all of Southeast Asia would become communist. And that's why they were engaged there for years. It was a bloody war with millions of deaths and a devastated country. One must be cautious, but of course, one cannot rule out what the future holds. But okay, I find Vietnam interesting in that regard, because the Americans ultimately withdrew. Laos and Cambodia actually became communist. Vietnam is still communist today. And now the USA has entered into a strategic partnership with Vietnam. No one cares anymore that they are communist. That's not a problem. But my real question, or my next point, is that I 
I still don't understand the logic of the communists. Trotzdem die Logik nicht verstehe, der, weil ja gleichzeitig von diesen Leuten zwei. Because at the same time, these people are claiming two things. Russia must be defeated so that Ukraine can join NATO, because in NATO it will be safe. That is the whole point. So Ukraine must join NATO to be safe. And at the same time, they say that if Russia wins, NATO will no longer protect the Baltic states. So the next ones will be targeted. How does that fit together? That makes no sense to me. Das macht für mich keinen Sinn. Ja, das muss man abwarten, Herr Lothar. Yes, we have to wait and see, Mr. Lataz. I am also a bit torn. I can imagine someone like Donald Trump just doing it, admitting Western Ukraine into NATO, reaching an agreement with the Russians, and then the East becomes Russian. I can definitely see him making such deals, as he always says. Sagt durchaus zu. Und ähm, unter bestimmten Bedingungen, das müsste man natürlich regeln. Was Under certain conditions, which would of course need to be regulated regarding the deployment of long-range weapons, I consider this perhaps more realistic than, for example, neutrality, which is your own research focus. I believe that this train has somewhat left the station, but we simply have to wait and see where it goes now. Ja, das, das muss man einfach abwarten, wohin es jetzt geht. Dann, ähm, Yes, let's briefly talk about NATO, if we still have the time. I would prefer to see NATO dissolved after 75 years, and you're on the side that says, no, no, NATO is still important. But the European, and especially the German role, should be redefined. Why do you still consider NATO to be the important backbone of European security? Why not rely on the European security and defense strategy, which also exists and could essentially form a European backbone for defense? Ein europäisches Rückgrat bilden könnte für Verteidigung. Ja, man kann, ähm, man kann es natürlich. Äh, yes, one can certainly wish for it. The best scenario would be if we had the United States of Europe, a strong military power and a government that acts sensibly. But we are far from that. In Europe, there are so many divergent interests. Take the Baltic states and Poland, for example. For them, it is crucial never to fall into the Russian sphere of influence again, due to their historical experiences. They also welcome NATO expansion at the time, which must also be acknowledged. The NATO expansion was, of course, objectively speaking, a deterioration of Russia's strategic position from the very beginning. That is true. But one also had to deal with these countries and the fears and needs of these former Soviet republics. In this respect, they ultimately found a home in NATO, so to speak. We also had the discussion in Germany about whether the reunified Germany could remain completely in NATO. And we did it under certain conditions regarding East Germany. That can be system stabilizing, but it doesn't have to be. Und das kann system stabilisierend sein, muss es aber nicht. Und wir haben nur im Laufe der Jahre die NATO Ost Over the years, we have uncritically advanced NATO's eastward expansion, increasingly disregarding Russian sensitivities. This ultimately escalated into the Ukraine war and is part of the prehistory of this conflict. People don't like to talk about it, but it is part of the truth of how this war came about. From my perspective, this war could have been easily prevented politically. It wouldn't have had to be fought if it had been handled sensibly. But as I said, it has happened now, and we have to see how we can get out of this war, as there is no military solution. This is a political task. Das ist eine politische Aufgabe. Das ist nicht mehr eine Frage an einen Ex-General. Das ist eigentlich ein. This is no longer a question for a former general. This is actually a question for a diplomat, for a politician. But they first need to come down from their war trip. I always try to help a little by critically pointing out that the military path is not a way to get out of the war. I wish there were such a way, then it would be fine. But to defeat Russia, the strongest nuclear power in the world, given the balance of power on the ground, it is not enough to just supply weapons, you really have to go all in militarily. But even this war cannot be won because the Russians have nuclear weapons. And that doesn't get through to some people.
the idea the NATO and a global There is the idea of a global NATO. Next weekend we have the next NATO summit in Washington and Japan and South Korea are also invited. What do you think about expanding NATO further instead of focusing more on the North Atlantic which is actually implied in the name? Nordatlantik zu fokussieren, also was eigentlich im Namen stecken würde. Well, in terms of the contractual situation, it is clear. NATO is clearly regional and geographically limited to the North Atlantic. It is a clear defensive alliance, and that is also the reason for us Germans to be in this alliance. And it has proven itself over the last 75 years. Now, of course, one must see that the security situation has changed. The focus is on the Indo-Pacific, and that will also be the priority of the next American administration, whether it is Democratic or Republican. The Ukraine war will no longer be as much in focus. It is about the military containment of China, which is already underway. New alliance configurations are emerging, also on the Chinese side. They have founded the Shanghai Cooperation Initiative. China will respond to this and the West must also respond. It is a very delicate situation. Some Pacific states want to remain free from what they see as an expansive China and are seeking the protection of America. Others, like India, are acting between the two powers and do not want to be drawn into this new phalanx. This is the ongoing process that is currently taking place. Reasonable solutions need to be found. I don't actually see an expansion of NATO. That is something different. If we are active there, also militarily and also from the German side, then we should not overextend ourselves, because national and alliance defense is the core constitutional mandate of the Bundeswehr. Der Kern des Verfassungsauftrages der Bundeswehr ist, aber wir sind natürlich auch als Welthandelsmacht darauf angewiesen. But we are naturally also dependent as a global trading power on protecting the overseas routes, and that is why our navy is deployed there. This is, of course, not without its challenges, given the systemic conflict between the USA and China. But that is the current situation. One must ensure through sensible security policy that these developments are managed and transformed into a stable order so as not to be drawn into a military conflict over Taiwan. In my opinion, the Chinese are behaving very rationally and sensibly. The Chinese behave very rationally and sensibly. Although they are portrayed as very aggressive in the Western media, they have rarely used their military power, if I may say so, as a military person. They have these border conflicts with India every year, of course, and they once had that brief war against Vietnam, in which the People's Liberation Army did not perform well. But otherwise, there was nothing. However, they are massively upgrading their military. They are on their way to having the strongest navy of all time. This must be kept in mind. But this can only be achieved through smart, balanced policies and not according to the script of some politicians regarding the Ukraine war. <coughs> if there is an actual conflict between China and the USA, whether over Taiwan or over Philippine Islands, that is a military confrontation, should Europe declare itself neutral or stand behind the USA? I think we don't have a choice. We are a member of NATO. NATO has existed for 75 years. If a war breaks out, regardless of what we want or don't want, we are involved. That's just the way it is. That's real politic. And that's the situation. But even at the height of the Cold War, from a German perspective, we had chancellors like Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt, who didn't go along with everything that came from the USA, but helped shape it. One must also mention Schroeder, who clearly opposed German participation in the Iraq war at the time. We positioned ourselves differently and told our alliance partner, not like this. Above all, we did not advocate for Europeanization. 
We always ensured that during the Cold War, the Americans and the Western allies, for example in Germany, were always involved in our security. We did not want isolation. I miss that, for example, in relation to the Ukraine war. We simply say, without having the means, that we have to handle it alone in the end. Especially when someone like Trump comes along with his isolationist tendencies. This is a complete overestimation of Europe and not good policy for Europe. In the European elections, you can see that people no longer want this. I find it very worrying that, in relation to the Ukraine war, the political center in Germany has largely radicalized. There are no more peace efforts, no willingness to compromise, only war rhetoric. The fact that the reasonable, moderate voices are coming more from the left and right is totally crazy for someone like me, who comes from the bourgeois political center. But I cannot understand this radicalization that is happening, this irrationality, this lack of differentiation. One has to be careful. People like Helmut Schmidt once said, and I have thought a lot about this, shortly before his death, Germany must always be careful. We are always very, very vulnerable. We are highly at risk, and we must ensure that we always pursue a wise, balanced policy. We are not doing that at all with regard to Ukraine and Russia. I agree with you, and the analysis of why this is the case will accompany us for years, if not decades. Dr. Vad, thank you. The link to your book will of course be included in the description for those who are interested. Is there another place where people can follow you? Do you write continuously on Twitter or somewhere else? No, I don't do that. I do it more as needed. I am often asked for interviews like by you, others do that too, then I see if I can do it. But ultimately I also wrote the book because every participation in a TV talk or a conversation leaves out certain other aspects. And I have tried to convey the most comprehensive picture possible of today's security landscape. One must embed the Ukraine war into international relations and understand what is happening there. I have tried to do that with the book, and that's why I have said everything I have to say there. I am glad about that because every conversation shortens the topic a bit. In that sense, I hope for many readers. Yeah. The link will be included in the description. Dr. Vad, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vad.